Spark. I, I, you, you can pump them now. I'm as tall too. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, welcome to the ordinance meeting of whatever today's date is. September 26th. Thank you very much. I don't even know what day it is right now between my business and everything else going on. Um, the plan for today is to discuss, we will be discussing, we, Dawn and I, Katie can't be here today, um, the draft that um, Attorney Saucier put together uh, for us. And uh, my ultimate plan is to, you know, basically discuss that with between ourselves um, and then in, uh, with the plan to be to bring it back in October for one last look before we send it up to the council. So that's where we're at. Um, I would, um, be welcome public comment right now. If you could keep it short, brief, and to the point, um, please feel free to go up. Give your name and your address. Oh, I'm sorry. I get, I jump right into things. Hold on one second. <laughs> um, do we have approval of the minutes? I move that we approve the minutes from the last meeting. All in yes, favor? Ma All two of us. <laughs> okay. And please note that it's Councillor Hamill and Councillor Katarina. And What's that? Oh. We, yeah, I made a motion. You have to second. And second. We and that no, would vote. <laughs> Good catch. Parliamentary procedure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no further ado. Go ahead. My name is Shelley Pelletier from 10 Snow Canning Road. Um, I'm here to discuss the loss of the opportunity to open a retail store in the town of Scarborough. Back in May of 2018, the tenant and myself met with the code officers about redoing a space for retail medical marijuana. He was told that would not be a problem. He submitted the proper paperwork to start the construction work. His permit was signed June 26 of 2018. Unfortunately, he did not go to pick, up, pick it up until late July to find out he couldn't because of the emergency moratorium put on retail stores. We then met with the town officers and was told he could not open his store until they got a full inventory list of what he intended to sell. Also that if any CBD products were listed, it would not be approved. We left the meeting feeling defeated. As we were driving down Route 1, we noticed two billboards outside two stores advertising CBD products. I am no way implying we were singled out, but I'm only trying to establish a timeline of events. I have attended all the ordinance meetings and open discussions on this subject. At these events, most of the attendees were cannabis-related business owners. There were very few residences in attendance. At the June meeting, I felt that we were finally moving in the right direction for the approval of retail stores until last month's meeting. After leaving the August meeting, I have never felt so frustrated about how the whole meeting ended. It was definitely a huge step backwards. As a grower, I want to be upfront about my business. I want to be able to sell my product and display it in a way that is inviting to my customers. I am really tired of having to sell my product out the back door sitting in, a, in someone's vehicle. Once again, what I do is legal. I should be able to sell it openly. If this ordinance does not include a section for retail stores, it is in no way considered what I have asked for a level playing field. Thank you. Anybody else? Hi, Denise Hamilton, 167 Two Rod Road. Um, question on, I'm in a residential area with a grower next door. I did notice in the draft um, and knew from before that he would be grandfathered, um, but I just want to confirm that he does still need to, if when this passes, that he does need to obtain a license and follow all the steps under acquiring a license, which includes um, being reviewed by the chief of police, fire chief, code enforcement, etc. Yes. That is my understanding. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. 
Anybody else? <clears throat> Henry Pelletier, 10 Snow Canning Road, Scarborough. I'm the owner of the building, and I've got 23 park rows. And I'm going back to when I bought the building 21 years ago. I was doing business with Setco, with a guy's name, Harvey. I was uh, going to purchase a building either in Biddeford or, was on, or have one in Scarborough. And Harvey, over the time of a month and a half or so, finally convinced me that I should buy the building in Scarborough instead of the one in Biddeford, which was a John Roberts building. And he introduced me to the townspeople. I didn't know anybody in Scarborough. He introduced <coughs> me to the building inspectors and the fire chief and some council people. And, and they gave me all the indication that they would do everything I, they possibly could for me to get this building off the ground because the town was ready to, you know, to um, uh, condemn the building. So I took it from nothing to where I'm 100% full today and probably 150 people work there. And I don't smoke it, I don't sell it, I don't grow it. All I do is deal with my 30 uh, renters. And, and all I can say is that the park rows are very intelligent people. Most of them are college graduate. They work hard at it. And now that they're trying to make a buck or trying to make a living, something like this comes up. Like a few of them already today have told me that if they aren't going to be able to sell the stuff here, they're going to have to look for a different location. And I understand that. I mean, their livelihood, this is my livelihood, and I've got my heart and soul in this thing. And I come out of Biffin, and, and believe me, it, uh, it took me 21 years to pay for this building, and, and it just became profitable within the last couple of years. And if you don't keep this building full, because I don't charge a lot of rent, then you know, it'll go back to the old way it was before, I guess. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not threatening nobody here. I, I, I must say that the town, the, the people that I did business with were at uh, Harvey from Sedco. Everything he told me, he stood behind it and made sure that it was approved or I got by with it or they gave me breaks or they gave me time to bring them up to code. You're never going to get this building up to code 100%. It ain't going to happen. And they told me that, and they knew it, and I was willing to live with it. But they've done an absolute perfect job in backing up their word. And like Jim Butler's here today, he comes down to my building. He was there again. I think he was there today. He's been down to my building numerous times. And every time we do anything, we make sure we do it by the code and it's inspected, and he approves it, and we keep moving forward. So this is kind of a setback, which I certainly, you know, at 82 years old, didn't expect. I thought I was doing a pretty good job out there. And I think I've got some real good tenants, so I'd like to keep them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else? Hi, um, I'm Nina McKee from 309 Black Point Road. Okay, maybe I'm a little old lady, but I understand, I, I, I agree. I think um, marijuana with a prescription from the doctor, fine. But I think to sell marijuana to kids, kids are gonna get it. No, there hasn't been a whole lot of it. Um, uh, uh, thought about what it does to the human body, what it does to the mind, what it does to the traffic, what it's going to happen to people that are high, you know, and they will get high from these, I think it's outrageous, I really do, and I think the town isn't getting any revenue from it, the town has to regulate it, and they have to change um, all sorts of uh, zoning and all sorts of stuff, and I just think it's not a good 
sensible thing. And I'm hoping that maybe, I don't know if it's too late, whether the town can opt out and maybe just opt out of the whole thing. Because I, and I, every single town is going to have different regulations. It's crazy. And the other thing is, um, I really worry about tri driving along and having someone who's on, uh, on pot and, and driving and, and the accidents and the, the lack of um, reflex time, whatever. So I just think it's absolutely outrageous. And so um, maybe for um, mar medical marijuana, fine. But to have it sold, I mean, it's crazy. So I know that it's an industry now, and people want to have this. I think it's crazy, really. So I just had to say that. And I don't know uh, whether it's too late for the town to opt out, but it probably is. Anyway, um, so I hope everybody has a happy time getting high. <laughs> so. I, I'm old enough so that I've only tried it twice, and once I cried forever, and the other time I laughed, and I thought, this is crazy. So, um, good luck. Thank you. Thanks. Anybody else? <clears throat> Members of the Town Council, my name is Nick Messer. I live in Scarborough at 210 Holmes Road, and my business is at 3 Commercial Road off Pleasant Hill. For years, Port City Relief has operated as a good actor in the town of Scarborough, working hand in hand with this great town to make a meaningful and direct impact on the well-being of its citizens. We have proven to be a leading example in the cannabis industry, opening our doors to provide full transparency for town inspectors like Jim Butler to get a better idea of what facilities like ours need to be successful, how to keep employees and ours and other facilities safe, and how to keep our local impact positive. While our industry presents changes, uh, that can be difficult to adjust to, adopt, or feel comfortable with, there are a lot of positive aspects to this budding industry that are going unnoticed. Many people have left behind, many people have been left behind in this economic recovery, with student loan debt stacking up, credit cards being maxed out, and housing prices continue to increase in this locality. Our industry presents a way to help those left behind, those who choose a different path in life, with middle class wages and opportunities to advance upward economically. Our employees enjoy, enjoy good take-home pay and command a strong buying power because of this astronomical demand for our product. They are able to use their buying power in small businesses like Kelly's Bakehouse in Delhi, where I know a lot of our staff, spend, staff spends thousands of dollars a year eating their delicious salads, sandwiches, and soups. They deposit this money into local credit unions. They save up for houses, cars, feed their families, we are able to use the profits that our employees help us to generate to purchase new equipment and renovate our once crumbling warehouse, which we inevitably and happily pay property tax on. That Scarborough doubled last year. Helping not only to alleviate the tax burden for single family homes and landlords alike throughout the town, but also improve our school, our infrastructure, and our city projects. While our industry presents some uncertainty that is inevitable with new industry as a town, do we want to be on the record as stifling a movement that is creating so much opportunity? Do we want to tarnish the pro-business uh, pro reputation that Scarborough, we all know, love and carries and thrives from because we are afraid to roll up our sleeves and figure out how to best align our town with this growing industry? I ask, that, I ask this from the counselors tonight. When you picture manufacturing returning to America in the great state of Maine, in what industries do you think this manufacturing will occur? It's time to shed the stigma of how, uh, it's time to shed the stigma now of legal and, com and a compliant industry and move forward together with a plan for how our team can be a leader in providing good paying, high quality manufacturing jobs we all stand to benefit from. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Hello, my name is Alicia Emmerich, 3 Haystack Circle. Um, I sent a detailed email to the entire town council, but I just wanted to highlight a few points. Um, I did some research. Um, <clears throat> my personal feeling is I could care less about someone's up and coming business. Um, what I care most about are the children in the community. I have five sons, um, and I care very deeply about them. Um, <clears throat> Uh, since Colorado, Washington, Oregon, Alaska, and D.C. 
legalized marijuana, um, the drug has continued to rise above the national average among youth age 12 to 17 in all five jurisdictions. Colorado holds the top ranking for first time marijuana use among youth, representing a 65% increase in the years since legalization, which happened in uh, 2012. Young adult use age 18 to 25 in legalized, in legalized states is also increasing. In Anchorage, Alaska, school suspensions for marijuana use and possession increased more than 141% since 2015 when it was legalized. <clears throat> In Anchorage, uh, after the legalization was implemented, because uh, according to Joe Sarwagdwi, the director of secondary education, he is quoted as saying, because it's legal in the community, I think the stigma around marijuana use is decreasing. Um, there's been a lot of talk about the supposed tax revenue um, to benefit Scarborough and any town that would vote this garbage in. Um, but uh, in Colorado, um, no one talks about the downsides, um, the social costs. Um, in Colorado, Calls to poison control centers has, have risen 210% between the four-year averages after, the, after it became legalized. That was from the Rocky Mountain Poison and uh, Control Drug Center. Um, Washington State has seen a 70% increase in calls um, in the same time period. Central Oregon hospitals have seen a 2,000% increase in emergency room visits due to marijuana poisonings. This, this one completely blew my mind. Um, State of Oregon. The Oregon Burn Center <coughs> has treated uh, burn victims. This is just between one year, between the summer of 2015 to 2016. 30 brilliant people have decided to create something called uh, butane hash oil which is where marijuana is superheated to obtain a, po a THC potency of 70 to 99%. Um, they were burned alive practically because of the explosions, costing the government over $5,154,000. I, in this email, I called this Darwinism at its finest. I can't imagine have no having nothing to do with my day than to go home and find, a, find some place to buy drugs, marijuana, or anything. But nevertheless, let's figure out a way to superheat it so I can burn the skin off my body. Really brilliant. Ms. Um, Mark, are you? I'm going to give you one more minute. Oh, OK. Um, I, there's more statistics here, um, which are just shocking. Um, but in a nutshell, you know, with my five sons, I have always I've used that time-honored um, parental tactic called guilt. And I can guarantee you that none of my sons engage in the use of marijuana and cigarettes they despise. Um, they know that I have held them to a personal higher standard as a parent. And I'm asking the town, the ordinance committee, and the future vote from the town council to hold this town to a higher standard and to say no and to say we expect more from our town. You can drive 2.41 miles to South Portland and buy it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. <clears throat> Excuse me, Jill Polster. I'm general counsel for Manly Medical at 137 Pleasant Hill Road. I think you made a brilliant point about parenting because that's where it starts. It doesn't matter if you're in a legal state or a prohibition state. Kids will get their hands on marijuana and if your state is run by the black market, where I come from, <laughs> I'm a southerner and a former prosecutor, so I know. I can quote statistics all day long, but a regulated market will choke out the black market. The black market will not ask your kids for identification. They will not lab test your Jill, product. If, if you would mind just addressing us, that'd be great. Thank so, you. I apologize. That's okay. Thank you. They will not lab test the product. They won't track it or trace it. They won't have employees who get to 
have insurance, who get to get mortgages, and all of the things that I cannot say better than my colleague did from Port City. Port City has set the standard here in Scarborough um, as far as being a model for a compliant cannabis business that has scaled to something that Scarborough should be proud of. I can only hope that to be standing here one day in the position that Port City is in, conducting ourselves the way they have. They've been a model for us. I think what has concerned me and on behalf of the uh, family that I represent is what another caregiver referred to is that, and I emailed the committee as well and Larissa with my comments directly, that we were here in June, we left the meeting, the committee asked for proposed ordinances, ordinances on all uses. Next thing we know, the agenda comes out for August and there's no retail. And I immediately sent an email and was told, um, and which I appreciate, of course, the communication, that that change had happened in an informal manner. In the, in the more than two years that we have been coming to these meetings, in this formal setting, in the public eye where government happens, we have not seen significant public opposition. We have not seen arguments based in law. I think there's a fundamental disconnect between the status of state law and what the town of Scarborough understands the status of state law to be. To not consider even people who are opposed who think there should only be prescription use of marijuana, you're shutting the door to that possibility as well in a retail environment. You can go to CVS and get a prescription, but what we have been told is we cannot have a caregiver storefront where someone can come who's been certified by a medical practitioner as someone who would benefit from having access to cannabis, and they cannot do that in a retail store environment. Prior to um, our remodel uh, at our space, you know, it was just a warehouse environment. And just because we put up some lights doesn't mean we're a retail store. We would love to be a retail store open to the public. And fortunately, the state provides us <coughs> significant guidance on what a retail store is, so we'll be able to work that out when the time comes. I had the benefit of being at the Office of Marijuana Policy this morning discussing this very issue. Um, and they were asking me what towns do because I represent 25 families trying to move cannabis businesses forward in different towns in Maine. And so what we see here is not different than other communities struggling to decide what to do. But the difference is in some of those other communities, there's either been significant public support or public opposition. There was not significant public opposition on a survey that you all chose to do. And, there, and like I said in my email, unless it's happening behind closed doors, which is fine, we haven't ever seen it at the meetings. We can argue all day long about the merits of legalized cannabis, but that happened here um, almost three years ago. So I think the attitudes are actually more pro-cannabis now than they ever have been. So I will say, I know that you're moving forward ordinances to opt in on many other uses, and we certainly appreciate that, because in our essence, the people that I work for are cultivators. Um, and have been cultivating here for over two years. I would ask, and I know you will look at the um, legal fine points that John Burke submitted in his packet regarding confidentiality. I think that's significant. And other than that, I thank you for your hard work. Of course, ask, continue to ask you to reconsider retail. And thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? Tom Falby, 140 Burnham Road, Scarborough, Maine, business owner, 148 Pleasant Hill Road, Scarborough. Um, I just wanted to address a couple of points. Um, acreage for rural farming, I think that should be at least half an acre and up should be considered for, for the um, adult use program. Um, I think the fee should mirror South Portland. I think it should be 600 across the board. I don't think there should be any different uh, differentiation in fees. Um, and then what did you guys do with Katie Foley? She was on our team. It seemed like she was with us in Ju June, and then she's disappeared. I think you guys, did you guys put her in a closet or something? Um, she she's, hasn't been able to attend the meetings for whatever reason. I know, I know. It's too we bad. We, we thought we had an ally. We thought we had an ally for storefronts. Um, 
You know, and I, I understand um, that the economics is part of it and people are feeling slighted by the state. Um, and the other thing is here on, what is this, C, 7C, a public hearing. Um, I would just wonder if that public hearing is before uh, the planning committee or if that's before um, another committee or the town council it just as a public hearing. So I was just wondering um, if that's going to be more specific. Um, and then lastly, I'd just like that's, to it's the term, I'm sorry. Um, it's before the town council is delineated in the ordinance. It is? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right, I must have missed it. Oh, okay, okay. So it's before the town council. Um, and then the last thing I would urge you to consider in this whole uh, storefront consideration is <clears throat> in this town and in Maine and in New England in general, you know, everybody is very uh, focused on trying trying to foster this these local economies and everything's local and buy local and support your local business owner. Um, and and I have. I don't have the opportunity to set up a storefront in here, but I've seen people come up here and they're all from Maine. They're all, they all went to high school in Portland or Wyndham or Standish or what have you. Um, and, and they're trying as hard as they can to try and make a go of something that is cutting edge, but it, at the same time, there's Wall Street money gathering as a gigantic tsunami in California that's going to wash across here. And, and maybe you guys won't be town councilors by the time that happens, and maybe someone else will be making the decision. But I urge you to consider that your decisions now are affecting people here who are local who could really benefit in the short term and that have a fighting chance going forward. Whereas if you're not here, or maybe you are here in five years, and acreage holdings, you know, which is listed on the stock exchange in, ca in Canada, comes rolling in here with a front man as, you know, coming before you to be, to be considered for licensing, you know, and, and they, they get the chance because they've got deep pockets, whereas people here, you know, they don't have the deep pockets. They're, they're scraping together. It's not like you're looking at millions of dollars of capital. Um, at access, so I, I just urge you to consider if, if you really are truly interested in local and local economies and trying to have local business owners and, and this whole movement against things like Amazon taking over the world, um, I, w I would consider, uh, you know, allowing storefronts. Okay. Thanks. Okay, uh, anyone else would like to wrap this up here? Um, could you hold on for a minute? Just have a seat. Thank you. Because you've already spoken, correct? Yep. Okay. Anyone who hasn't spoken who can speak in two minutes? Okay. Um, you had a question? Yeah, you can I ask it very quickly. Yep. Um, regarding um, the gentleman just mentioned rural farming, half acre, um, totally do not agree with that, especially if it's in a residential area. Um, you know, you have two acre minimums on um, farm animals over 100 pounds. Mm -hmm. I would ask that, you know, there be a larger um, acreage requirement in rural farming in a residential area because you're talking wastewater. We're all on wells and septics and we don't need contamination. Okay, thank you. All right, I'm going to close the public hearing at this point. Um, so it will now be um, for us to discuss. What I would, uh, what I would like to do, um, first I'd like to, um, I know I'm hogging things here, I'm sorry. Okay. Is the thing that, and I'm going to look at uh, attorney sauce here for this, difference between dispensaries and retail? Could you talk about sure. that? Because I think there's a lot of confusion um, out there. Yes, I will. And, uh, yeah, just want to double check. So, as currently drafted, your ordinance would allow dispensaries, but not medical marijuana care, care retail sources to find. So, this is from my edification. Yeah. 
So a dispensary would mean that I could not just walk in off the street, even though I have a medical caregiver card, and buy from that particular, unless I'm a patient of theirs, or would I? Ha or how does that work? Just so the public will know. Yeah, and some other people here may actually know better than me, but you, I think you have you would have to have you would have to be a qualifying patient. Right? Okay. I, I, under either Not scenario. No distinction. Right. There's no distinction. There's no distinction. Is, is Hold on. To by the state, there's it's like. Jill, do you mind? I, yeah. And I, and I can speak to the I can speak to the definitions of both, yeah. but in terms of the, the question about the patient itself. Yes, but I also, hold on, hold on. I, I want to make sure that, that we're clear on the difference between caregiver storefront and dispensary. Dispensary are, the, are like a wellness connection. The large interest that where they limit them, I think it's up, going to be up to 12 now. So there will be 12. So that is a large dispensary that's basically a marijuana retail store. Um, a caregiver storefront is the same thing, um, open to the public where they can walk in and if you have a medical card you can be served. If you don't have a medical card you can still walk in, they're just not going to serve you. Okay. Thank you. But don't the dispensaries, isn't there a certain number of dispensaries per county? Yeah, I can right. answer those questions. Right now. Yeah. Okay, yeah. all right, thank you. Sorry, I was going to get that, to that point. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. the question you had that I think just did just answer is you do need a card, you need a yeah. hard card either in, in either location. There is a def the state has defined both, so I think it's important to see what those definitions yeah. So a registered dispensary by the state is an entity that's registered by the state mm -hmm. that acquires, possesses, cultivates, manufactures, delivers, transfers, transports, sells, supplies, or dispenses marijuana-related supplies and educational material to qualifying patients and the caregivers of those patients. If you go to the dispensary provisions uh, in 2428, it delineates what they can do. It's much more extensive than what a caregiver retail store can do. They can manufacture, for example. They can cultivate. They have independent cultivation authority to allow mm -hmm. to allow dispensaries in the community, which you currently are closed to. Yeah, caregiver retail stores, on the other hand, are, are more limited. We finally actually do have a definition for state law. We didn't until this year. Okay. So even though we were allowed to regulate them, we didn't have a definition of them. So towns were kind of making that up as they went along. We have a state definition now. It means a store that it has attributes generally associated with retail stores, <laughs> including you know, limited to a fixed location assign regular business hours, accessibility to the public, and sales of goods or services directly to a consumer used by a registered caregiver to offer marijuana plants or harvested marijuana for sale to qualified patients. So it's really just the retail, retail component. Whereas a dispensary is first more heavily regulated by the state, I would argue, um, both in numbers allowed and, uh, and the application process, but also they have, and partly the reason for that is because they can do more things. Mm -hmm. they can, Question. Yeah. So, getting specific, the only one that I know of that's nearby is Beach Boys in South Portland, just over the Scarborough line. What are they a caregiver retail store? So, the closest dispensary to Scarborough, you would have um, there's a wellness connection in Portland, and then there is a, a dispensary in Biddeford as well. So, those are dispensaries, and then Beach Boys would be an example of a caregiver. Retail store. So caregivers are more highly regulated. So your question about the difference seems to be a scaling issue. Yeah, mm -hmm. and the reason I asked it is because um, I, so people will be served who need medical marijuana, whether we have retail or not. Well, there's currently eight. So there are two nearby that the person said there are currently eight that are allowed, but the new law allows for six more. So it's okay, so there's a, be located, but there will be okay. six more allowed in the state. That's okay. statewide. So I don't know. That's dispensaries. Hmm. Dispensaries. Hmm. So they're limited by number. Hmm. And are they limited by county as well? Originally, yes. I don't know about the new six. People in the audience may know more than that. But when I read it, it sort of eliminated some of the old provisions. So there were, it was by area. Originally they're eliminating the yeah. by area. Yes, that's right. Um, well, there's like 50% of the licenses that the acreage holding has that are shorter than them. So basically, you get open star room up to acreage holding to close all of this up. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, well, I did. I, I, we'll probably get into this later, but I, I still have questions about the, uh, you know, the acreage discussion that we've had. 
and the grandfathering. Yeah, we're going to. Yeah. Okay. So that. if I'm jumping in, I'll wait till we cover. Is that okay? Yeah. Sure. All right. Sure. Um, so we have in front of us, and it was available to the public uh, on our website, I believe, because yep. I get it from you directly. So. Um, that what we are, the changes to the drafts include the following, and I'm just going to read this for the, for the public who may be watching this. No duplication of state effort by the town regarding background checks. No references to medical marijuana caregiver retail stores as an allowed use in the town of Scarborough. Definition of school has been amended to include child care facilities. No longer references an overlay zone, and that has to do with the fact that if we aren't allowing retail, is that correct, then we wouldn't need the overlays? The staff believes that if, if there is, if we do not move forward with the retail stores, that the um, existing uses, the existing cultivation facilities, and then expanding into manufacture and testing, that those fit neatly into designated um, zones already, yep. and so no need for an overlay. Okay, thank you. Uh, language around signs has been removed and references statutory requirements. Enforcement has been changed from the town manager, excuse me, from the town manager to the code enforcement officer or the police department. Uh, and lighting must comply, <coughs> excuse me, with good neighbor ordinance. Um, so then we've got Manufacturing would be allowed in uh, business office research, Haggis Parkway, Crossroads Plan Development, limited to the Innovation District only, industrial, industrial overlay, light industrial, and rural farming, which is <laughs> where we're going to get into mm -hmm. more of the details. But and to be Larissa. very clear, manufacturer would only be allowed in rural farming as an accessory, accessory to use. cultivation. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, testing would be allowed in business office research, Haggis Parkway, and the Crossroads Plan Development Innovation District only, industrial, industrial overlay, light industrial. Am I reading that correctly? Yep. Okay, I have a question on it. Hold on, please. Okay. Yep. Cultivation is indoor cultivation only. In industrial. In excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, and then industrial overlay, indoor cultivation only. Um, light industrial. Thank you. Light industrial, indoor cultivation <laughs> only. And then RF with performance standards, which were uh, delineated below. And again, these are um, things that have come from our staff, um, I, uh, perspectives from the staff. So the questions that we're looking at at this point are, do we wish to allow cultivation in the RF? And if yes, what performance standards, i.e. setbacks, acreage minimums, and maximum canopy? Jean Marie, I want to make yep. it very clear. To allow new cultivation, existing cultivation would be grandfathered in. Yeah. We aren't, we're, let me stay with this, OK? OK. Um, And then do we wish to allow for dispensaries? And where would they be allowed? And then how we would license cultivation? And then this whole thing about canopy and licenses and, and whatever. Um, yeah, and then we've got the fee structure. And of course, we were given the state fees, Portland's fees, South Portland fees, and Auburn's fees. I will tell you personally, I. I know uh, one of the speakers spoke that they'd like to see South Portland, and I don't blame them. They're all low, but uh, I would not be in favor of those. Um, and I'd be looking personally at what the state structure is at this point, but that's my opinion. And, and is the state, uh, if people are cultivating or whatever one of these categories they're, act, they're active in, assuming we approve them, they would have to pay state and Scarborough fees, so it would be two fees. And the question came up about manufacturing. Larissa, could you talk about grandfathering and whatever? So to my knowledge, and I'm glad that Jim Butler is here, but when we did a review back in June when we were looking to see what um, industry operations were operating in the town of Scarborough, I was not made aware of any legally operating manufacturing facilities. So when we've been designing these, we've been 
talking about having only grandfathered cultivation facilities. So if there are facilities that are manufacturing, that was outside of my understanding of what we had operating in Scarborough. So I've been, I've been Then I would say that you were a legally operating business prior to December 13 of 2018, and therefore by state law you were granted. There was another one I don't know. I just invested $1.5 million in just the last time. All right. Um, if we could go to the next page, and I have a question. <laughs> Because we have a separate here, section six, and then it says definitions, right. and then we have separate definitions under. So this under. was, oh, you know what, I'm going to let Phil speak to why. Okay, yeah, I was going to. I'm sorry, what's that, Jan? We are looking at the handout yeah. versus. <clears throat> so I'm going to go, there's just two different ordinances. So the sort of larger one would be a new. That's the Scarborough yeah, licensing, proposed. Licensing okay. licensing ordinance. It's similar to you have other licensing yeah. ordinances in town. So that, that's right. separate. The other document's only one page at this point would be amendments to your zoning ordinance to incorporate what needs to happen from the zoning perspective. Okay. So from, that's why it's separated. It's separate okay. Amendment, probably, it would be an amendment to your zoning ordinance. Can I see that for a second? I, sometimes you can bring that one up. Because uh, I see one potential mistake in it. So the way it was last time, it simply added a definition that was yep. consistent with some, what a marijuana establishment is. So yep. You have, so you don't have to use that one term throughout and not list them every single time. Uh, the second thing is that it, last time, would ask to create an overlay district, so I did that. The basics of that this time, staff is recommended not to do that, so right. but we're not doing that. But added just a section called performance standards, which is blank at this point because there hasn't been anything proposed. Yeah. But that's if, if uh, Larissa just mentioned, if you do want to add performance standards for cultivation, you know, the kinds of things you'd see in the zoning ordinance. You have a number of, you do that for a number of types of uses already today. If you look at your zoning ordinance from home occupations right. to daycare facilities to everything, to a lot of different uses, it'd be similar there. So you could go a little further than what the licensing ordinance says in terms of what they need to provide. You could do that in your zoning ordinance. That's where that that's why there's a blank there. I didn't have anything to add. Okay. There. So then if we so if we had when we I should say adopt <coughs> a marijuana establishment licensing ordinance, then as an ordinance committee we will also have to do something with performance standards under zoning. If you want to add performance standards. Okay. What you would have to do for sure under zoning is add which zones you would like them to be allowed uses. So before, and that's what I understand staff is still working on getting to use. So before it was going to be overlay district. Now it's going to be certain zones. And so you literally just add it to each zone, and that's an amendment to the zoning ordinance. It means it has to go to the planning board for a hearing for the hearing and then a right. note by the council. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's the minimum you need to do uh, yeah, in the zoning ordinance. Did you have a question? No, I just wanted to uh, uh, build on the point, if I may. Uh, my bias is uh, I prefer that we try to do that work while it's in committee before yes. we go any further and go as okay. far as we can based upon our experience okay. and you know what we know. I'd, r I'd rather not leave that for mm -hmm. us to solve later on when we have a problem. You know, so they would be put together as a, as a one-piece packet. So um, Jay, our Chase, our planning director, he certainly is going to make sure that whatever needs to happen in that zoning ordinance is is clear, and the whole packet will go in front of council Great. with the licensing, and then making sure that the support for that in the zoning ordinance is, is there. Great. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> um. So, with that being said, under the definitions on zoning ordinance, I'm being very linear here. Yeah. <laughs> it um. On that page one, section six, uh, one, two, three, fourth line down, it does talk, it says, and medical marijuana caregiver retail store. If we're not going to do that, we need to strike that, that correct? Right, that was added. So that was deleted last time, and I covered it below, but I didn't take it out there. So you're right. Okay. That's yeah, just making the assumption it. where so that's how we're going. Yeah, if we decide to do that, yeah. okay. I just needed to ask that. Right. And what I would like to do again, because I think, for my purposes, and please, if anyone, anyone here, 
at the table feels otherwise. I'd like to go, just go quickly down through this chapter 1018 um, proposed marijuana establishment licensing ordinance, if that's okay with you guys. And we, what we will do is, obviously we have the section one purpose that hasn't changed, authority hasn't changed. Definitions have not changed. So you'll see changes yeah. where you see bars on the side. Oh, okay. So the licensee was just changed to be a, a cleaner definition. Um, a licensee shall simply mean a person licensed pursuant to this ordinance. Okay, mm -hmm. I missed that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then you've also got then a change here on a marijuana establishment? Yep, so if now if you look, um, you'll see under lined language, a marijuana establishment does not include an adult use marijuana store or a medical <coughs> marijuana caregiver retail store, which are not permitted in the town of Scarborough. And there's going to be a change there to reflect your what you thought yeah. in the other one. Right. Right. Okay. If I have a Hold on. What, right now, sir, we're working between ourselves, and you guys are just here to listen. Okay? Thank you. Um, and I'd suggest when we get to that point, if we could have you speak at the microphone yeah. so make sure that's recorded and we can hear you okay. So Yeah, when we, after so, we get done with, thanks. with this, I'll get some more. From you. <coughs> Owner shall mean a person who's beneficial. What's the change in that? Um, there was just a, there was, there was a, an odd, there was a missing word and a, a kind of an abandoned letter oh. A. So there's oh. no <laughs> substantive change there. It was, it was a All grammatical right. change. Um, this is just formatting. That's why you oh, license application, that's just formatting. Yep. Okay, that's on page four. Mm -hmm. And that's all of this here? So yeah, there was some... Pages um, four or five, yeah, if you would There just were some changes, if you notice, um, this was some rearrangement. Jay is really great at making sure our ordinances are actually easy to read. So he just did some um, realignment in that next section of, if you look on the next page, you'll see some deleted lines. Yep. They've simply been moved up to be more, um, in, I think, a better place for okay. the ease of reading of that ordinance. Okay. Um, I don't think that there was any substantive changes there. Um, in G, just putting, making clear because of the way the sentence was um, written before, it just said in another lowercase t town, comma, capital T town. Right. Just really clarifying that we're talking about town in another Scarlet. town or somewhere else in the town of Scarborough. Yeah. Um, and then the H is again just kind of clarifying that the town of Scarborough. Mm -hmm. and we'll go to page six. Those are those places that were moved forward. Um, and then in L, you'll see that there's a consistency. So in the last meeting, there was a question about why we yes. have 750 some places and 100 and 1,000 and others. So now it's consistently 1,000. Okay. And then also in L is that new language that was referenced in the memo about yep. clearly defining a school. Mm -hmm. um, o has added in the length, the words and ventilation, so a copy of the odor and ventilation mitigation plan. Yep. Um, and then I'm not sure Q&R. So we took out, uh, based on your direction last time, took out the requirement for back <coughs> consent for a background check and mm -hmm. other background check provisions of Staff suggestions, consent for the right to access the property is required. Those are for the inspection purposes. Mm -hmm. And uh, evidence of insurance, which was in there. Right. But we that evidence of that. Do you want me to just keep on going through? Or well, or just hold on one yeah. second. Uh, Dawn, are you? I'm fine. I'm you're tracking fine with it. where we are. Yep. Okay. And I've got uh, a red line version I think on this morning. Here. We'll kind of talk back and forth. Let's go back. Right. <laughs> so, uh, section C, you'll just see the number five has been um, struck, the medical marijuana key retail. A medical marijuana caregiver store, if it's not being allowed in the town of Scarborough, it does not need a fee structure. Can we back up? Yes, we can. On the on the fees, you've got all these blanks. Right. So the expectations there are that this to committee is going to direct staff. Okay. Yes. What you would like to have is numbers in those blanks. Okay. And that's where you have the examples of what other communities have chosen to do. And you should certainly feel free to, you know, embrace a one of those, or you are welcome to go rogue and come up with your own numbers. Can I, is Phil, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, Attorney Swaz here. Um, does the state have limits 
Not that I'm saying I'm going to charge a million dollars or anything, but I'm just out of a curiosity, is the state stated and who gets these fees? So there is no limit in the statute itself, but there is a limit to what municipalities can charge for licensing fees. They okay. have to be reasonably related to the, yep. to the service you're the, providing. The licensing you know, provisions and the what right. you're providing. So it's not an opportunity for revenue. Um, some communities think it is. Um, it's really to, to pay for the program itself. So the cost of you know, your code enforcement officer's time and your uh, the administration for the planning board. So all the sort of administrative costs. And so it's going to be reasonable. That's so this is staying in the town. These it, fees are staying in the town. The town. This okay. Does come from the town. Yeah. I wanted to make that clear to the public. Yes. So. The, the fee, any fees would come from the town. It must be reasonably related to the cost of the program. So then moving on to page eight, um, again, you'll see. Um, language that has been struck through regarding background checks. Yep. Trying to eliminate any redundancy between the town and the state. Um, also, further down on page eight, there was reference to a health inspector. Mm -hmm. We do not have a health inspector yeah. in the town of Scarborough, so that was clearly not needed <coughs> in the ordinance. Um, and then <coughs> at the last meeting, there was some question about renewal applications and the amount of time that they needed to be submitted. So um, staff is recommending inconsistency with our other kind of applications. 45 days prior. I was going to ask how expiration. we came up with that 45, but that's what's consistent with any other renewal. Well, so. we're kind of all around the, <laughs> we need to get some consistency in general, but we, we feel like the 45 is kind okay. of a, a reasonable <laughs> expectation and, and similar to some other areas. And so okay. we're going to get there. Consistency is good. Um, then on page 10, you see some language being struck, and that's simply because we defined school very clearly elsewhere. Right. Uh, where, I'm sorry, I uh, just lost section myself. Three. Section 3. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, uh, Phil, I'm going to kick to you for the strikeouts at 5. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Okay. Um, and then we'll move on to section 4. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it wasn't redundant. It was not necessary. Not necessary right. if we're not going to do. We, yeah. we did keep 4, which is the setbacks, just to generally how it's measured. It's yes. Because you are requiring the setbacks from schools. Yes. So that's it's applicable to that. We did, okay. We didn't want the between establishments anymore, so that's why 5 was struck. There had been discussion that if we were to um, require setbacks in between, um, for instance, growers, yep. that that would put a huge number of our growers in non conforming. Mm -hmm. spaces right. and mm -hmm. so there was just no right. need to be doing there. Okay. So five um, this, this, is, this is the grandfathering provision. This really restates what's already in state law, quite frankly, but it just makes it clear and then um, and then it adds a sentence which um, is borrowed directly from our zoning ordinance. So that's just being consistent with how non um, I guess you call it abandoned uses or right. discontinued uses um, when you would lose that grandfathering status that's consistent across the town. So we just brought that language directly over from zoning where it says if any non-conforming use passes for more than one year, um, it sort of essentially loses its grandfathering status. That's what that means. So, but, so in this case, would it be, and I'm assuming, and I should never assume, that this covers that if for some reason someone who's in the marijuana business, whatever it is, chooses not to do that business anymore or sells it or whatnot, that non-conforming doesn't follow with the ownership? It does or? follow with the ownership. So let's say that, Jean Marie, let's say that you were growing marijuana in a non-conforming manner. Right. Okay? But you were grandfathered in. I was grandfathered, grandfathered in the in. old thing. Yeah. You could sell your business to Don. Okay. And he would continue to be allowed to oh, operate okay. that business in that non-conforming okay. manner. What could not happen yeah. is for you to decide that you no longer wanted to have that business running. Yeah. And then two years later, sell it to go Don. Back. And then and go Don, back. Don would not have that okay. benefit of that grant. Okay. Yeah. That's what I wanted to make be clear. So that's yep. a general principle. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. Uh, 6C, this is under security measures, a locking, before we just said a locking safe was required. Yeah. Sort of marijuana. This actually came from the Mr. Burke, Attorney Burke's suggestion is that you said, for a locked room, that seemed to be. Yeah. Reasonable. Yeah, not everything can fit into a safe. Right. So it's like it's a locking room. Yeah. Um, There's some questions, um, now that you number nine, the questions about going further than what the state law requires. 
mining is a tricky area under First Amendment law, and so what we decided to do is just make reference to what there already are some requirements for signage under state law and statutes, so just make reference to those requirements. Okay. Um, and, and those actually, and they already do uh, include at least the first one you had in there before, which was the likelihood of reaching certain three persons. Um, so it, it's, it just refers to what's already allowed by the state. Okay. Because Scarborough's sign ordinance is somewhat more restrictive than the state. Um, we've lined it up a bit more with the state in some manners, and I'm looking at So our sign, sign, and I guess I'll look to Jay, I don't think so. I think that what we did, we spent a lot of time on signs trying to make sure that it was yeah. content neutral, and so we wanted to make sure that we were doing the same thing with the, any sort of sign um, ordinance language within this ordinance. It is not the town's right to read the sign. And decide right, that's right. Go forward. So right. this is just making sure that the town is not stepping in anything it shouldn't step right. in by just pushing it off to the state line. Okay. Yeah. Um, sure. Right of access. Back, yeah. um, background checks are again being struck, so not to be redundant. And then adding in that every marijuana <coughs> establishment shall allow the code, Scarborough Code Enforcement Officer, Fire Department, and Police Department. So just adding in those other two departments. Mm -hmm. um, and then. Moving on to page 13, under violations of penalties, uh, originally the language came through, um, as it is in some communities, that it could be enforced by the town manager. It's not really how our mm -hmm. system works. Right. So the enforcement has been shifted to code enforcement or the police department. And then um, there, section 12 on page 14, there was a question about appeals. Um, and wanting to just kind of Jay, did you want to speak to this? Because I think you had some good kind of things to bring forward to the ordinance committee for them to consider. Yeah, if you would. Sure. Wouldn't mind, yeah. Hi, Jay Chase, planning director. Um, yeah, so the only question that I had here, really thinking, uh, talking to my staff and others, uh, really thinking about how we deal with um, administrative appeals. Essentially, this language says that if any resident or anyone doesn't like sort of the action that our code enforcement officer or our, our police department took, they could appeal that, and that appeal would come directly to council. Typically in our zoning ordinance, you know, when if, if someone disagrees mm -hmm. with an action that the, the code officer made either in a determination or a determination not to take act, whatever the case may be, which is often also talked about with our town manager and sort of supported there, um, that appeal goes to the Board of Appeals. So the question was, does the town council sort of want to be in, that, that's really the question, who's, where, where our zoning ordinance already typically directs those type of administrative appeals to the Board of Appeals, which um, is that where we might just want to stay consistent? And or does town council make sense? And I think where, um, you know, the conversation that we had was, well, this is a license that's issued by the council, so maybe the council is the one that makes sense. So. Um, I, don't. So I, think that I, I guess I'm just throwing it out there more as a question than yeah. with a, a, an answer for you. Go ahead, Don. So I had a question. So when you said uh, with zoning ordinances, they go to the ZBA, to the Zoning Board of Appeals, <coughs> if you're not happy with how something is enforced, mm -hmm. right, how it's applied. But do we have other examples where it doesn't go? It doesn't go to the ZBA today? Because I'm a liquor license complaint. Yeah. I, yeah, that's I'm not, wary. Not sure. I'm yeah. really wary about stuff like this coming to the council, you know, and having the council sit in a role of enforcement. You know, there are times when I would like to do that, but personally, but, <laughs> but I'm not well, sure yeah. I would want to recommend to the council or sign up for that. Right. I, I, I just don't know if that really is appropriate. Uh, but I don't hear of many other examples, if, you know, outside of zoning. And again, I, I typically deal with our land use ordinances. I don't typically dive into our liquor licenses in <laughs> this. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, that, but we can that, certainly that do is, some research on that. That we could put aside for some more. Yeah. Look, I agree because yeah. when I read it, I'm going, uh, why would it come directly to the council? The council's a political board, so to speak, and by political, I mean small p, not large p. Mm -hmm. um, and it would be more. Yeah, it'd be interesting to know what happens with liquor license. Yeah. Sure, we can look into that. Yeah. I think that the, it really, as Jay mentioned, the, it really kind of lay in the idea that where the council is the one who issued the license, um, that they should be the one that then yeah. hears appeals about that. 
But to Jay, when Jay and I were having kind of conversation at a staff level, hmm. Jay expressed a concern that I think is, is also really important to think about. If there is, it is possible that sometimes it happens that our ordinances are used to further neighbor disputes. And it always puts everyone in kind of an awkward position. Hmm. And there is some concern that by having this be appealable directly to council, that that may incentivize using ordinance to further neighbor disputes yep. in a, more than if it were to go through something like sorting vote of appeals. I, I, I think that's a great point, and I'd like to build on that. It, it, you know, I'd like the fact of it going to the folks that have the subject matter expertise <laughs> to decide, you know, rather than we're just making judgment calls, you know. I, so that's that's also just sort of the, my bias. I don't have a solution, but yeah, I agree. Well, do you? Well, so, but your bias is actually why we're here. So that's <laughs> okay. So if you'd like, um, so that we can bring back a really mostly yeah. complete package in October yeah. to kind of reach that goal of, yeah. that Jean Marie expressed about um, moving it to council, would you like us to come back with? The language of Zoning Board of Appeals, unless yes. my research into how we deal with liquor licenses yes. is strong enough to, to yeah. write you a separate memo on that, so you can yes. th yeah. that work for you? Yep. Yeah. Don't we have another appeals board? <laughs> I mean, I'm not thinking appraisals. I would like every appeal possibility that we have. <laughs> another, but another group that I would do this. I've got the Board of Assessment Review. That's right. The board board are, they no. wouldn't Zoning Board enough. of Appeals. Um, those are our two least popular boards to find people to serve on. But isn't um, there one that reviews personnel issues? There's another. There yeah, is. I'm on that. Your, what's the name of that? It's a it's a subcommittee of the uh, um, town council, uh -huh. but it has to do. But they never. They seldom sit, right? They, I've never sat yeah. in six years. I've been on the council. Anyway. So, so uh, one of the things that I would kind of like to maybe, so I think the zoning board of appeals, for direct appeals, because there is also that safety. Um, where it's a renewable license, every time that somebody needs to come forward to have that license renewed, the public has the opportunity to speak during that public hearing. And so that's when the town council would be hearing directly about complaints about the, the licensee. Yep. So it may be kind of a belt and suspenders approach. If you could just kind of trust that the Zoning Board of Appeals would deal with any direct appeals. Yep. And then if there, people didn't want to go through yep. that process, they could yep. just kind of speak to public yep. during public hearing time for the relicensing. Yep. Yeah. Would that work? Court of Free? last consequence, yes. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. <clears throat> I should just, not to complicate, but I, <laughs> I, I just That's what he gets paid to do. You know that there is a third option, and that's in the red line, too, which is that certain decisions can also not be appealable. State law has made that clear, at least in the zoning context. So, uh, and that may be the case with liquor license, so we'll do some research on that. Yeah. See, you know, for example, if, if, some, if there's a notice of violation that you're violating the liquor license, I'm not sure if that's Okay. Um, but under state law now, it's been clarified through both case law and statute that in the zoning context, a town can decide that certain notices of violation or decisions of the cross are, are actually not appealable at all because they're just advisory, if you will. Yeah. You know, the real action comes if the, the person who's allowed to do that, whether it's a town council or town manager, then files an enforcement action in court. So, hmm. but some towns like to keep that option because it does have a local level of due, due process, if you will, or appeal. Yeah. Sort that out at a local level before, before litigating. Um, so I just I have to point that out because that is an option under the statute and or under the law. And uh, but whether you have a town council or zoning board, it's up to you. Right? Okay. The reason why it's in there and it's in the communities is because although you're a political board, in this case, you're actually a quasi judicial board. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just like you are when you're issuing those liquor licenses. That's you're you're sitting as a yeah. issuing authority, license yeah. authority, if you will. Um, so that's the uh, idea behind it. But you, you don't have to hear those appeals. You can decide mm -hmm. to step somewhere. Okay. Okay. Nick Jim has something to add to that conversation. Oh, sorry, I didn't miss you. Go ahead. <laughs> you have to yell at me, Jim. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Jim Butler, the Fire Inspector Commercial Code Officer. So, not to complicate this anymore, but I didn't want to sit back and be quiet. But other <laughs> communities have another board. Not that you guys want to create another board, but I know the town of Old Orchard Beach has an administrative review board and I used to be the code officer down there. Mm. And you're now cresting into licensing of businesses. So on their board, they have representative from the police department, fire department, a representative from the council, uh, town members at large, business owners at large that are on this uh, administrative review board. And then they report back to the town council on what their actions were. They have public hearings. 
I believe Mr. Saucy is very familiar with that because him and I, I think, had to work through some things down there in Old Orchard Beach. But it's an option, so it's not going to the Zoning, zoning Board of Appeals, which might not right. have the expertise to brush on that subject. Right. And it has more involvement in the public, and, but with appropriate departments like mm -hmm. the Police and Fire Department. So That's just a suggestion. Great. That's yeah. helpful. No, That's yeah. a very good idea. Yeah. Yeah, I can bring that language to Old Orchard Beach. Yes. All the time during Old Orchard Beach. Okay. And I've sat through recently administrative review board proceeding on a business license. Okay. So what, what that board does, you said, uh, describes more staff level, yep. but they make recommendations. To, to the council. So, and they can enter into a consent agreement that says specifically if, yeah. if there's a violation, they can propose it, uh, it's chaired by the town manager. If they can enter into a consent agreement, that's great. If they can't come to that agreement, then it goes to the council for possible revocation or suspension of the license. Oh, I see. If, so this is in the context of a notice of a violation. Great. Of a do, you, do liquor licenses go to... The, this administrative board in OOB, do you know? I can't remember off the top of my head. Yeah. I, I, I can say that they do. If yep. There's complaints, police complaints, things like that. They do go to that board over right. hand before it goes to council. Great. Interesting. It's, it's a way to resolve it at the lower level yeah. before Great. you take it to the council. Terrific. But, sorry, yeah, the, the licenses are issued by the council, probably with that work by the administrative board. Right. Great. Business owner in OOB. I was going to say, and how do you know that? <laughs> All right, um, I feel comfortable moving this proposed forward. Do you want to, Mr. Hamill, make any about the uh, fee structure? Do you feel strongly one way or the other about which fee structure? We have the state one, we have the court one, we have the... Yeah, I, uh, in talking, uh, Jean Marie and I talked about this before the meeting, and um, I understand that our use an example, I guess our liquor licenses are $15 and in Portland they're $1,500. So, you know, I, you know, as a... We need to do a review of these. <laughs> big opportunity there. So I, uh, I'm in favor of doing a review and trying to do something that's going to be reasonable but also competitive. Um, and, I, and I think we're, we're probably not competitive even with some that we have now. So, um, but I, I don't know, if, you know, if I would pick a number, I think it'd be probably, uh, you know, more like Portland and less like, well, I mean, Auburn is pretty high too, the highest yeah, they're there. all high. Yeah. So I just, I'm going to go toward the high end here on licensing fees because of the reason that we're bearing the burden to administer this thing with no help and no revenues otherwise from sales. So I, you know, we've got to get funding somehow to help offset the cost mm -hmm. to the town on this. So mm -hmm. I going to lean on you the lean towards end. Portland. Yeah, yeah. The difference between the state and the Portland one is cultivation under tier 1 cultivation they reach 500 tier 2 cultivation the state is 3000 Portland is 5000 tier 3 cultivation they reach 10000 manufacturing they reach 2500 testing they reach 1000 so really the only difference between the state and Portland uh, is the two thousand dollar difference here between the cultivation? Yeah, uh, and I'm fine with that. And I know the business people are going to hate it. You know, if I were looking at this purely as a business person, I would be screaming and yelling. So I, I understand that, but it's got to. We we've got to get funding somewhere because there are services we're going to be deploying, and we've got to help offset those expenses in some fashion. Just to clarify, are you talking about adult use at the moment? Adult use. Adult use. These are adult use only. Well, they, they're the fees. If you look on page on seven. Our, I would go to our fee schedule page and wherever, you know, apply these where they. It does. So on, your, on the ordinance. Right. Yeah. Can you remind us why it's only issued in adult use? These are for cultivation, use. manufacturing, and testing. They don't show an no. adult it's use. It's adult. It's still use. Those definitions come from state law. So the way it's. The testing labs have the lowest overhead. The tiers, you know. Hold on. So, so I guess, I'm looking at page seven here, right? In the draft ordinance language itself, so we don't have a space where we're licensing, where we have a fee associated with medical marijuana cultivation. Yeah. Right. Is that because the state law prohibits it, or because we simply? It's, yeah, it, it's really not addressed very much, but frankly, we've created a new category called the cultivation facility. Oh, medical marijuana well, cultivation facility. Right. Yeah. You can't do more than 500 square feet or 30. Right. Yeah, it's not, it's, what we've created in a lot of communities have created uh, is something called Medicare Water Cultivation Facility, which deals with off-premise off, off 
premise, meaning off residential premise businesses essentially. Um, and that's I think where you would have a fee for those kind of mm -hmm. activities. But. And that fee would be quite low because as um, Ms. Bolster just pointed out, they're capped at a very few number of plants that they're able to grow. Great. Mm -hmm. So but these fees don't. So they don't match. I mean, they don't. Yeah, but looking here and here. Yeah. So, so what we've got, what it appears to me, to what we clearly have is, looking under uh, Section Six B, license fee, we've got adult use marijuana cultivation facility, Tier One. Would that line up with the five hundred? And I'm looking at Mr. Sauce here. Got a slight disconnect. Yeah, looking at what you're looking at. So we've got in the example, we've got Tier One, Tier Two, and Tier Three, but in the I agree with this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that comes from, those are categories under state law, so maybe we just didn't grab any kind of, or the communities, I haven't seen this, maybe are mixing and pushing together certain categories in terms of the amount. Yeah, because mm -hmm. we don't have, like, we've got nursery cultivation down there, but I don't see a you, number. You can decide, for example, that's just listing the categories. You can decide just to have one fee for a cultivation facility if you want to. You don't have to divide it out like this. If you oh. Yeah, and we haven't even discussed right. what sizes and shapes we right. wanted them so far. So I'm, we're maybe a little ahead of ourselves maybe on we're trying to pin ourselves. it down. Yeah. But, and at least but, we, but at least we know which direction, direction we're heading we, in. So if you could come back, if you don't mind, I'm being bossy here, uh -huh. <laughs> with what's Portland doing with some of these <coughs> different sub... Yeah. It has those numbers, but you're right, not for... Right. We'll see what they're doing for those categories. They don't have a separate, yeah, they don't have a separate... Um, Fee structure that I saw at least for nursery right. cultivation. So we will mm. come back with Portland yeah. values. Mm. And then if someone, if you could find someone similarly situated to Scarborough who has a nursery cultivation okay. separate. Well, this is all really new. I know. <laughs> the whole thing is like. In fact, they're not. You know, there's no nursery. There's nothing yet, right? Yeah. Right. But it will be here. And there's yeah. just someone who smells or sells immature plants. They don't sell like cannabis. Right. The only thing I think of actually have a copy of Portland with me right now, their ordinance is I'm thinking they don't, so they talk about license types, they yeah. only license tier one, two, two, tier two, and three, three. That's probably why they don't list a tier four or a nursery yeah. uh, mm -hmm. fee now. And that must have to do with what, how much canopy they allow, perhaps? Mm. So they're not allowing greater no, than 7,000 square yeah. feet of mature yeah. plant canopy, perhaps. Yeah. Okay. Right. They're so putting in apartment buildings. <laughs> But as far as adult use or medical marijuana testing facilities, we're good with the 1,000? Yes. And as far as the adult use or medical marijuana product manufacturing, we're good with 2,500? Yes. Yeah. And with the medical marijuana cultivation facilities, oh, that's a, so that's going to be set. So these are adult. Yeah, use that's all tiers. adult use. So we got to look at what the medical I, marijuana. I will look to see if we have yep. any communities that have examples of separating that out. OK. I think as I think Stanford does. Uh, Mm. Auburn. Auburn. Mm. We okay. Yeah, that'd be great if you could come back with those. That'll give us some numbers to plug in Terrific. there. Yeah, I'll we'll knock a few off there. Yeah. So if I could have, um, is there anything else that I'm missing in this particular? Because what I would like to do is have a motion. We do have, if, if I may. Yes, please. Um, in your memo, we ask you to, um, in number two, make a decision about dispensaries. Yeah, hold on. My page is wrong. Message. Okay. And I apologize. Oh, for sorry. That. Yeah, no, I was going to go back to that after we do this. Or should we need well, to have it in I here? Well, I thought I was hearing, from, what were you going to do? Maybe I misunderstood your intent. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, what I was going to do is, is make a motion to move what we've got here so far with what you're going to do and move it to October. Yeah. So. I thought that that's what you're going to do. Okay. And so before you do that, okay. because dispensaries are addressed. Yes. In this, okay. If you would direct staff as okay. to which, what you would like to have happen with that, then we can bring to you in October as complete a draft as possible. I would say yes for dispensaries. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. And we will get those in. Sure. You said you don't want any retail, but it sounds like you only want big corporate retail. Well, but that's I'm willing to do dispensaries, but not the retail. That's where I'm coming from. The same level. Well, putting the money in the Marlboro type of companies instead of the small business. I know, but that's where. I hear you. Us. Well, 
But you guys are just trying to stand up for the community here. That's what the point of this whole thing is. Well, we try to weigh, you know, all sorts of different things, all sorts of different sizes, so scope, whatever. I got 10 years experience in real estate, but something I follow real estate trends, I don't think you guys quite understand. I'm a real estate broker. <laughs> and how your impact, all you guys, all your residents, the, any town resident may not quite realize the impact this industry has had on you guys, mm -hmm. but it has had a positive impact mm -hmm. on you guys. I follow the real estate trends. It's what I do as a hobby. I've seen the prices of stuff astronomically increase over the years. Mm -hmm. There's no denying. Like, I don't even know how many people are employed okay. by just our building. Alone, right. But i got to imagine it's over 100 people. They spend the money at yeah. their stores. Your gas stations, your grocery stores. No, and, and we've we had someone speak to the economic benefits oh, of the marijuana know. industry. So I'm gonna knock knock this you off from the audience. The yeah, okay, thank you. Um so at this point it sounds like you and I wanna do the dispensaries. Are willing to look at that? Yes. I am. Okay. So let's do that. Um and we dealt with the fees. And then we're looking at licensing cultivation. That seems like. And then, if you could, um, I think that we, when staff was meeting, um, really just wanted to kind of clarify what you wish to see happen in the RF. If you wish to. Yeah, uh, that needs that's a great more question. Work. Yeah, yeah, so, I mean, I, I like to have some context for, uh, you know, I mean, it used to be Scarborough was made up of farmers and clamors, right? So it's not really like that so much anymore. Now, so how much farming do we really do now in RF zones? You know, and what type of farming, and then how close is that to what we're talking about here with cultivation of marijuana? So, I mean, that is a, you know, out of the ballpark question, but I'd like to get some grounding on that okay. from someone uh, before I wade into how do I feel about mm -hmm canopies and how big and how many. I do live in the RF zone myself. I used to live in one. <laughs> and he, there is a movement, believe it or not, to go back to farming. Yeah. And I can understand. Yeah. I mean, I see marijuana cultivation yeah. definitely in RF. I don't have a problem with it. I do agree with um, the woman in the, I'm sorry, I forget your name, <laughs> in the front seat, front, that the setbacks are, are important um, with this. And, you know, at this point, I, I lean towards having marijuana cultivation be inside, even if you're in the RF zone, hmm. um, just because of the mm -hmm. odor issues and this and that and the other thing, potentially. Hmm. Um, but that's hmm. me. Hey, Phil, do you know, have other towns done that? Or Larissa, do you know of other towns yeah. made a move like that? Yeah. I see. I think we so, need more information yeah. on RF. I yeah. think that we can do for the next. So, how yeah. do other towns address outdoor grow versus indoor grow? Yes. Yeah, I, I like the, what you have to say about that, uh, and I think yeah. it could help us on the odor side. Um, but but I am inclined to to try to you know treat it as as much as we can, like a, you know another agricultural cultivation activity. I know it's not, and I know there are you know, differences, but at least well, I'd like to start there. Yeah. And, so and if I bring to you in, in your packet next time, um, I think I heard Denise mention that we have, and I haven't looked at the farming ordinances, so I, I, but the minimum for a certain size of animal. Like, so if I bring to you what we already oh, I have. I know that's for a fact. I okay. No, no, yeah, no, and I know that So too. if I bring you yeah. a, a, what we already yeah. have on the books regarding exactly. agricultural yeah. activity in the yeah. RF, so you can yeah. see what's yeah. already being governed? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And there's there's a state there are state rules regarding agricultural too that you need yeah. to be looking at. Yeah. Okay. You know, like, and I know this from my real estate <laughs> background, is that agriculture, um, someone who's in an extra agriculture, well, it's bad, so sad. The agricultural activities. That's why I'm saying this odor thing is could cut either way. Okay. So anyway. Okay. We, we, we grow hemp in Scarborough, and it smells exactly like. I know, but I'm not going to get into that right now either. I don't know. Now, I will remind everyone in the audience uh, that, remember, this is new. I know, I know it's been three years since it passed, but we're dealing with something that's fairly new. Um, public opinion is mixed still on a lot of this. I would like to get something at least started um, and going, and maybe you guys and gals may not be happy, I mean, with not having retail at the moment. That doesn't mean it won't come down the line at some point or whatever. Oh, sure. 
please? And I, excuse me, hello, excuse me, thank you. So, you know, we need to get things going. Um, and I, and I speak for myself and I'm going to let Mr. Hamill speak for himself, but I am not in favor of the retail at this point. Um, just because I, there's just so much more involved with that. I'd rather make the baby steps now, get the cultivation, get the people who are already working here, the grandfathering, whatever. Let's get that, um, going, get it structured and then work into retail potentially, maybe. Um, that's just how I feel, Mr. Hannah. So I, I, you know, to build on what Jean Maria said, uh, you know, this process is, uh, you know, is a deliberative one and it's, it's a uh, iterative one. Um, and it's, it's taken, I know a lot longer than, than most people would like. Uh, and I understand that's that general frustration with things, uh, like this, especially big, big decisions like this in, in the public realm. So I'm just tell you, we're, you know, moving, you know, at a steady pace, it's not as fast as everyone would like. I'm very sensitive to what we're hearing from the business people who are concerned about, you know, forfeiting business opportunities, but we need to bring the whole town forward with this. And you know, we're barely at the point now of trying to finalize what we feel about this in committee. And even for that point, we could recommend it to the council and the council may have a different idea uh, right. about it and may reject certain things. So and all along the way, there will be an opportunity for you to have input right. and to, you know, to try right. to influence the outcome of it. So, so mm -hmm. I just ask you, you're gonna have to be patient that the state uh, has set uh, a guideline for Q1 of next year, you know, calendar Q1, and, and even now they're saying that's optimistic. So I, you know, there's no way we're gonna move much faster than that, you know. So I just, to, just for sake of setting expectations. And I know that uh, all of you have something to, hold on. Okay, let's, all right. So, hold, hold on, Don, please. So, my request of all of you out here, as you know our email addresses, please, again, I'm saying send me your thoughts, send me your whatever. I mean, there may be something, I still haven't seen anything that's convinced me otherwise. I will tell you, I have received emails from folks who do not want to see retail in town. And you heard from a woman who, she's, she doesn't, well, she doesn't realize, I, I mean, I'm not saying this to be pejorative or anything about, but it sounds like she doesn't even realize that train's already left the station. I mean, marijuana is legal in the state. It's just how's it gonna be used, where's it gonna be used, how's it gonna be um, um, what's the word I want? Um, regulated. So. So for direction yes. for staff, yes. so that we are coming back with what you would like yes. to have in October. Um, and we're gonna come back with information about how we deal with the licenses from an appeal standpoint. Yes. And um, Phil's gonna provide what an administrative <coughs> appeals board yeah. could look like, okay? Because why not? It's just do it up. Do it up. Um, gonna find out how much farming currently happens in the RF zones and look to see what we have for ordinance language and state language that governs RF activity, <coughs> agricultural activity. I'll look to other towns to see how they address outdoor versus indoor grow in rural areas. And going to come back to you with a full list of Portland's fees for um, those tiers. See if we can find examples. So Portland doesn't have a tier four, and it sounds like no one has nursery cultivation. So, um, we're gonna look at a couple of tiers. Yep. And then yeah. we'll look at um, Auburn, Sanford, and another town that I heard right, mentioned, sir. Brunswick, for medical marijuana yes. cultivation facility. Yep. Does that sound like inclusive of what you were looking to hear from staff? Yes, yes okay. it does. Uh, one, right. one comment I'd like to make, I, I've tried to convey this in the past, is that have you ever played, this is just something that occurred to me, but have you ever played that schoolyard game, Crack the Whip? You mm -hmm. know, where the person, you, you take hands and you kind of go around in a circle and someone on the end gets thrown thrown off. <laughs> anyway, we used to play it. But that's kind of what happens with the... Yeah, sorry, sorry, maybe a, you know, too, too, uh, too harsh a, 
uh, a metaphor, but uh, that's kind of what happens with public input. I mean, I think public input is going to come in hard and fast at the end, yeah. and I want to make sure that we're moving in a steady, measured pace, and for the folks that are most experienced with this business, you're tracking with us the whole way. But this won't really get live for people until they see it on a town right. council agenda. Right. You know, most people really don't follow activity at a you know uh, at a committee level. Yeah. So uh, that's neither you know right or wrong. It's just a fact. So I just ask you to. We're trying to balance that with the folks that have been here from the beginning and attending every single meeting. Mm -hmm. So thank you. So for the date for the next meeting. Are yeah, we it's to? October seventeenth, I believe, is what I'm looking at. Available? At four o'clock. I don't know if Katie is or not, but I will ask her. That's what we have it booked as. Were the dispensaries sales for medical and rec or just one of them? You're gonna are you gonna allow dispensaries to be medical and rec or one another? I think that the count they have not had a chance to think about that. Yeah, we need to get more. Well you said you're okay with dispensaries, I just didn't know what yeah. you're on that right? Just that they're listed and there were references to the medical marijuana statute. Yes. All right. And I would just also want to re reiterate what Councillor, uh, what Chair, Chairperson uh, Katarina has said about, uh, you know, I know a couple of people mentioned that, you know, the distinction between dispensaries and, you know, outside large company money and folks that are here are small businesses. So if there's, you know, more you want us to, to know about that, then uh, I would encourage you to, you know, send us, send us your, your feelings on that and, and, uh, you know, uh, I, you know, I'd like to learn more. So, so I've heard I've heard the arguments. But Can you just shut the door? Whoa, 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 whoa! whoa. Excuse me, <laughs> guys. Please. I hate banging gavels, but I will if I have to. All right. I know. Not usually my style, but you were a school teacher, though. I was a school teacher. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Anything else? Motion to adjourn? I would make a motion to adjourn. I would second that. All in favor? We're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Now you can come up here and yell at me. <laughs> that was